Thank you, John. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our presenter for this evening, Jimmy Young. Jimmy and I met during FDIC at a stress and trauma training that was put on by the Indianapolis Fire Department. Um, we found a common connection through the city of McKeesport, Pennsylvania, where my great grandfather settled from Sweden to work in the steel mills. Um, Jimmy's family worked in the steel mills as well. So Jimmy has served 28 years as an active firefighter with the city of McKeesport, and he serves now as the state director with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. The last three years, he's been on cancer-related disability. Tonight, Jimmy will share his journey with us, and this includes um, being his service at the side of the Twin Towers, of the World Trade Center in the aftermath of 9-11 and the many challenges that he's faced and overcome since then. Jimmy, we are so grateful for your experiences that you're going to share with us tonight as your journey continues. Uh, we really look forward to hearing your story and your dual missions on peer support and firefighter cancer support network. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, can you hear me? Everybody good? Thank you, can you hear me? Everybody uh -huh. good? Okay, perfect. I'm coming to you from the garage, my happy place. Uh, I built this house a while back, and one of the things that I'm so proud of is I actually put a functioning fire pole in there, as well as, uh, sorry, there we go. I actually got a fire pole in my garage. So I'm kind of like, uh, you know, when it comes to fire stuff, actually, I got all my gear hanging on the wall, and, you know, a couple nice deer that I've taken over the years. My, my journey uh, is right now where I'm at, uh, 28 years on a job, the last three, is three and a half now has been on a uh, cancer disability, uh, including several shoulder issues that uh, I got to work out a little bit tonight. Thank you, Katie. That was very, that mindfulness. Uh, I'm definitely going to be jumping in here a lot more often just for that, because uh, I think that's very beneficial. Uh, but my journey... Uh, started on September 11th when we got called into work because and we and McKeesport is a small fire department we're a 28 man fire department uh career uh work for four shifts 24 on 72 off the beautiful thing about McKeesport is the fire department is if you like to fight fire you are going to have a lot of fun here uh, naturally, nobody likes to uh, go to a house where somebody's living in and the house be on fire. But if you if you enjoy the job as much as I did, uh, this was the place to work. And fortunately, when you're off duty and there was a structured fire, you had automatically got to come in for four hours uh, overtime and fight the fires. And I, I tried to make every one of them. I, I uh, I think for right now, I'm probably the guy that has the most structure fires under his belt uh, because we've had this opportunity to come in when you're off duty. And some of the other guys that got hired with, their wives worked, and when they had kids, they couldn't get to the fires. But I made 95% of the fires, and that would come back to bite me later on, and I'll, I'll talk about that soon. But uh, on September 11th, we all have a story of where we were if we were old enough. And uh, we'll never forget what happened that day. Um, when we got called in, we were automatically alerted to a plane flying over our vicinity and it was hijacked. And it, at the time, you know, where I rank, I drive a ladder truck. Uh, so I'm not high on the food chain to know where this plane was going or what destinations other than we had a plane in our airspace and get ready to go on anything. So once we watched the buildings fall, uh, we knew that we had just witnessed thousands of people killed right before our eyes. And like all of us watching this podcast tonight, we all remember that horrible day and the anxiety that went along with it. And quickly, what I, I said to my partner, uh, Chris, who was uh, a couple years on the job, and I, at the time, I think I was on the job about seven years, uh, he had uh, said, I'm with you, man. If we're going, we're going. And uh, we reached out to our, our fire chief and said, hey, 
pulled him aside. Look, we want to go to New York. We don't know what we're going to be doing, but we figure we'll uh, go to offer our help. And the chief was hesitant at first. And he was uh, said, well, let, let's see how this unfolds. And, you know, as the time went on, we watched the other tower fall and we, you know, uh, it's stuff started to happen. And then when, when 93 went down in Shanksville, uh, we were like, look, we're going to New York. Uh, and then the, the chief was like, okay, uh, represent us well, like you always did. And just make sure, uh, you, you make it home. And naturally it was like, uh, he shook our hand and, and we took off at midnight and we arrived in New York city the very next morning. And we didn't need a map. Uh, it was one of the things we talked about on the way there, uh, stopping and getting a map of New York so we could have an idea of where to go. But as we got to the George Washington Bridge after about a six hour drive, uh, we didn't need a map. And the column of smoke coming off of the corner of that island was so massive, a, 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 you couldn't even put it into words what it looked like. But we got on what was called the West Highway and turned into West Street, which runs right by the uh, World Trade Center towers. And as we got close, uh, closer to Midtown Manhattan, we could see the ambulances lined up on the side of the road. And as we're going by and, and I'm like, holy cow, these ambulances are from all over. Uh, and uh, ironically, I, I saw one that said White Oak Rescue and I'm thinking, what's the chance that they're being a White Oak Rescue in New York? And sure enough, it wasn't. It was my crew from a couple miles away from here. They sent a crew too, and uh, it was it was. And we would meet them that night of the the first time that we dug down there, uh, and that was by chance. All the firefighters in there to see them guys was pretty amazing. But uh, we ended up going through checkpoint after checkpoint. Uh, they were armed with police officers, and at some point there were military, or I guess National Guard there, and we were telling them, look, we're on our way to uh, Squad 18 is where we were trying to hit, because we saw in the news that they had lost all their guys, and when uh, these cops on Houston Street at the Avenue of the Americas, uh, they said to us and to me they said look i don't know where to tell you to go but there's a firehouse right here right caddy corner from where we're standing we know that they have a lot of guys missing and they might be able to tell you where to go or uh put you to work and i'm like okay so we pulled in my van and uh went in and got to the the first guy that we saw and i said hey my name is jimmy young this is chris cersey we're from uh, mckee sport fire department local number 10 uh, we're right outside of Pittsburgh. We drove all night. We're here to help. Uh, anything you guys need us to do. And uh, the, he was like shocked at when he when he heard my, I don't know, my offer of help. And he went in and to this house watch and grabbed the captain and Captain Tony Variali. I'll never forget him. He comes on and he says, you guys came from where? I said, I'm from McKeesport, Pennsylvania. It's a career fire department outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, we drove all night, man. We're here to help. And he says, your name's Jimmy Young. I said, yes, sir, it is. This is Chris Sirs. Uh, He's like, go back into the kitchen and get yourself something to eat. Uh, we'll put you to work here. Put your gear over here by this engine. You're going to be riding with us today. And I'm, um, okay, yes, sir. So we, we, walk, we walk out of the firehouse and grab our gear. And we're look, I'm looking at Chris and I'm looking at all these buildings. Like I'm thinking, uh, what did we just get ourselves into? Uh, our, our tallest building is 15 stories. And I'm looking at skyscrapers and uh, I was just taken back for a second, but uh, we, sh we quickly put our gear next to their gear and went back to the kitchen. And again, it's 7 a.m. So the firehouse is like slowly come, waking up from the worst day that they ever had. They had 11 guys lost that day that went to work that morning and didn't go home. And when we went back into the kitchen, I said to Chris, look, there's people had brought food, like pastries, all kinds. I said, look, let's, let's get 
we'll put our our firehouse breakfast together for them. So Chris and I started making eggs and toast and uh, we find some meat in the refrigerator and we're just going to work in their kitchen. And soon the news from their fire, from the fire guys that we had met went through the firehouse and we immediately were uh, approached by about a half a dozen firefighters. And they walked into the kitchen and said, who are you guys? And I said, I'm Jimmy, this is Chris. We're from the Keysport uh, Fire Department. And they said, no, but how did you pick this firehouse? I said, I don't know, we didn't have a map. I looked at Chris because I told Chris, make sure he got a map in New York. And uh, again, we didn't need a map. There was no, uh, we, were, we were directed in my opinion, uh, to this firehouse, because these guys said, look, out of all the firehouses in New York, come, come with us. We got to show you something. And we, they took us to this area on outside this wall of Ivy and this wall of Ivy had uh, firefighter plaques on it with the name James Young and Chris Seidenberg. And they said, uh, six years ago, we lost these men in a fire. And somehow we got a Jimmy Young and a Chris Searcy to help us on 9-12. It was the most remarkable thing that they had. I don't even want to call it remarkable because at the time, the, the atmosphere in that house was such a disaster. Uh, they had these guys missing. And as they tried to put the pieces together, uh, the fireman named Tony Salerno, in a letter that he would write to our fire chief later, uh, explaining that somehow they thought it was a godsend that their Jimmy and their Chris came back to help on the worst day in the New York City Fire Department's uh, history. And they were uh, immediately a handshake was followed by a hug and, and they were, we don't know how you got here, but we're glad to have you and we're uh, we're going to be going to work here shortly and sure enough man we finished our breakfast and turned them on to our breakfast sandwiches and uh and then quickly we got detailed to uh start putting new hose on their fire engine that came back because all their hose was completely covered with all kind of crap we had to strip the hose off and we had new hose down in their basement so we started putting hose on it was like a uh, a unique day of work uh, for us. Uh, we learned new ways to load hose and we just did what, what we were asked to do. And during that time, as the morning went on, the 11 members that were missing, and they were missing at this time, they weren't considered lost yet. Uh, their family members were showing up at the firehouse. And every time you would hear an eerie bell, these bells would ring five times. And over the loudspeaker, they would announce a name of one of the firemen that they had found. And uh, what, what happened when that bell would ring, everybody in the firehouse stopped because they didn't know if they were going to hear one of the 11 mentioned. And when the families started showing up, they didn't want the family members to hear their names over the loudspeaker. So what they wanted to do was get tables and chairs upstairs into the firehouse so the family members could go upstairs and the priest from the local church was gonna come over and talk to them while the recovery and started happening. And, and they, they started like, uh, trucks started coming. Like I said, man, we were getting that truck back back in order. And as, as this transpired, uh, we were asked to go to pick up tables and chairs at a local church in this half a block away. It's St. Anthony's Church, big old stone church in the middle of Manhattan. And like I said, we didn't know if we were going to be handling our bottles of water at the Red Cross. So anything we were asked, we were doing. And we got in, in this pickup truck, which is really a unique pickup truck. Uh, this pickup truck was driven by Greg Monahan. And this truck was now the ladder five they took the ladder five placard off the side of the ladder five that was destroyed in the rubble and they drilled it to the side of this guy's pickup truck who responded to new, to the, the attack from home and parked his truck close enough that half of it was burned 
and half of it was damaged. Like some only one light worked, and uh, the the lights were just melted on his truck from the heat from how close he had parked. And uh, but that was the it ran, and Chevy did a thing called like a rock, and um, they got a picture of all the guys from their fire company sitting standing uh, all around their truck. And the, the motto from Chevy was like rock. And that's what they went with. And that they, Chevy took care of that guy. Well, we get in this truck and we go over to St. Anthony's church and pick up tables and chairs. And this rectory, uh, the priest comes down from the rectory and I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, oh my God. And I said, Father Kieran Monahan? He says, young. Good God, I didn't know you were a fireman up here. I said, I'm not, Father. I'm a fireman in McKeesport. Now, meanwhile, Kelly, Fireman Kelly, who went with us, that drove this truck over there, is looking at me and looking at him. And he says, Father Karen, you know this guy? He says, yeah, he was my biggest troublemaker in high school. He said, he didn't know he graduated until I gave him his diploma. And I said, true story. Legit. <laughs> I barely made it man and uh he's like I, I did not know you were firing up here and I said well I'm not I said he said well what are you doing up here are you nuts I said well that's a long story but uh, uh, you got work cut out for you there's a lot of family members that are asking a lot of questions and uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, help them uh he said well let's get you loaded up and, and sure enough uh, we got some tables and chairs loaded in the back of his truck and off we went and soon after father Kieran uh, came back over to the firehouse and had stories for these guys that were, you know, uh, yeah, this, you know, and, the, and their jaws were on the ground. For one, we walked into this firehouse, and my name's Jimmy Young, and the, the, the attachment to their Jimmy Young, and we were like one or two years age difference, and same with Chris Seidenberg and Chris Searcy. They were uh, very close to the same age, and it was just so bizarre. And then just have the father Kieran Monahan uh, situation where he gave me my high school diploma 20 years before the attack in the key sport. So out of all these crazy connections, uh, here I am, here we are. And I had, I handed my bro, my father Kieran, my phone, and he's talking to my brother and he, you know, the next thing, you know, uh, a bus pulls up and uh, Tony Salerno, the chauffeur for Engine 24, where Jimmy Young worked uh, on Engine 24, he said, look, uh, you, you don't have to come with us. You can stay here and, and run calls or you can come with us. Uh, you're called. No, no pressure, whatever you want to do. I said, I'd one look at Chris. And Chris was already on his way grabbing his gear. So it was no, there was no decision. We were going to the pile. And we got on this bus and uh, it, if anybody ever played sports uh, and was going to the big game where no one's talking, it, it was uh, the, the quietest ride uh, because no one knew what we were about to get into, except the guys that were running as beams were hitting the ground as they were surprisingly, some way they survived. and. And I got to talk to many of those guys in, in a, a party that would happen a couple months later. Uh, but well, I'll get to that story. But we get, we get on this bus and we get off on the West Street right near the, uh, the overpass that where they had set up the command center. And we w started walking through these buildings, which I now know is the Verizon building. And what you got to remember now, in, in that area, all the grid was shut down. There was no power. And the only way you had power was with your flashlight. And this was daytime. We're walking through a building. And this was probably around 12 o'clock noon. And we're walking through this building. <coughs> and as I'm watching the, uh, the, the guys walking towards us, and I could see them, they're firemen, and I could see they're carrying body bags. And we kind of like all got on one side of the wall as we're walking and we're watch, walking past them. And, and there was like six guys on each bag. And the first one went past six firemen, second one went past six firemen, third one went past six firemen. And their, their, their looks in their eyes, they were zombie-like. They, they weren't 
they were in another world. It, it was like they were in a trance. Honest to God, that's what it looked like. And, and I, I was trying to like, kind of like what we do, you make eye contact with somebody, give them a nod, you know, and there was nothing. They had blank stares in their faces. And I'm like, oh my God. The next, there was two firemen carrying a body bag that was folded over a couple of times. And that's when I realized how bad this was actually going to be. And as we got into a, lit, a well lit area that the windows had been busted out right across from the North Tower, the guys had uh, like from FEMA had come in rapidly and set up. It looked like a flea market of uh, yard sale tools, but any tool you wanted was free. Any tool you, and guys were grabbing shovels, buckets, uh, sawzaws that had batteries. But the thing was, once you used the sawzaw to cut metal, uh, once the battery died, well, there was no way to charge the battery. You would just drop the tool and go on to something else or, or, or hopefully somebody else had a battery. But once those tools died, they were useless. And, and eventually they did get power into there, but for what we were using and when, how quickly we were doing what we were doing, trying to search for people. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't working. It wasn't working at all. Uh, not that guys weren't trying, man. It was just, you, I don't know, man. When, when we got there, I just started the fire truck that was burnt off. Tony Barry Alley, Captain V, he circled everybody up. He said, look, we're here, man. And you, you guys from McKeesport, man, I, you're on my roster. Stay close. At, at all times when I look up, I better be able to see that yellow gear because you're, you're my responsibility. And uh, we're going to go to the same stairwell vicinity that it used to be in the North Tower where our, our guys radioed. And we're going to try to get to that, pile, that part of the pile. And we're going we're gonna to dig today, tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month till we find every one of them. So everybody be careful, watch each other, protect each other and, and let's go. And he led us up that pile and down that pile. And, and when we got into this area that the beams had like twisted and turned and went underneath, under the ground, I'm watching these guys like slide down this beam on their foot. And once it got to a pile of rubble, they actually climbed under and the beam uh, had a void underneath it. And once you got under that beam, you were able to go down further. And, and I'm like, oh God, my wife told me don't get killed up here. And when, it, when the beam didn't fall on me, I thought, okay, uh, the butterflies were gone. Uh, it was no longer, uh, if I was gonna get killed, that was gonna be where it was gonna happen. So I, I was like completely, free and clear of having my mind set on one thing, working as a team, working to try to locate what I thought would be people that needed help. And the real realizing that it wasn't uh, who we were going to be finding. We were going to be finding pieces of people. And that was very hard to, uh, to put together. Uh, because we were putting these pieces of people in a, in a five gallon bucket and that bucket would go to a, somebody that had a light blue shirt on. And it, it just seemed, you know, bizarre, uh, gut wrenching. Um, and it was, you know, all night long, all day long, all night long. We got out of there around 11 o'clock at night and got in that same old, old burnout pickup truck with the ladder five placard on the side of it and on on our way back to the firehouse we went where they hosed us off with cold water to close our pores off because it warm water would have kept them open and we would have absorbed a lot more of the uh, hazardous materials through our skin and that was they were concerned about that day one uh, that we weren't going to be further injured by what we were doing and actually the paper mask they gave us, they were useless other than to wipe the sweat off your face. And, uh, you know, the, the probably the most beneficial tool that I have, it wasn't even a tool, it was a bottle of water that they gave me. I was able to slide it into my radio pocket 
and uh, I would sip on that. But I, I realized something very quickly that as hot as it was where we were, you, you had to take your fire gear off, except your pants and your gloves. You could not function with a coat on because it was so damn hot where we were. And, and I immediately thought of how, how much I was in need of water and thinking that if you're injured underneath all this rubble, and honestly, we were in pockets of molten fire where the fire had turned metal into molten, looked like molten lava in some of these pockets, how deep down we got to where we were at the subway level where at any other time, these, these shopping malls would have been filled underground. And some of the, just the beautiful things that, uh, that would have been before. And unfortunately, we were there at the worst possible time. But fast forward out of that, pit and out of that hole and back to home and trying to put together something that uh, I promised Tony Salerno. He said, don't ever let them forget what these guys did that day. And it was kind of like the world's largest rescue mission. And I kind of took that to heart. And I said, you know what? I, I promise, man, I, I'm going to do my best. And we, we dug for four days. And uh, in that four days, we got to see a lot of stuff, including the president, uh, when he was there, and it just it just was this a, a an unbelievable event that uh, I never thought I would be where I was by just raising my hand and saying, "Hey, I'm going to go to New York," uh, and I was glad that I went. I never once, ever, including today at this point, wished that I hadn't have gone. And I'll explain that soon. But as we went, went home, uh, naturally our fire chief in the city and everybody was like, oh, wow, you guys went to New York. Thank you for representing our city. And, and they celebrated us and not that we wanted, and it was like an unwelcome celebration because we didn't find anybody. We weren't part of an, a rescue mission, all this stuff with, the divine intervention of ending up at that firehouse where the names of Jimmy and Chris were and Father Kieran. Uh, I really thought that we were going to be part of a, a big rescue mission. And unfortunately, the only rescue mission was the thought of their Jimmy and their Chris coming back to help uh, through Jimmy and Chris from McKeesport Fire Department. And, and when I saw that in a letter that they would send me uh, a couple months later, uh, it it kind of hit home. And in, in that letter was, and actually it brought tears to my eyes. I'm sitting there reading it with my wife. And at first when my fire chief, it came addressed to my fire chief. And when he read it, and he read it to my crew, and uh, Chris and I were just like, what? They thought it was a godsend? You've got to be kidding me. And their their captain also, Captain Barry Alley, also wrote a very nice letter uh, explaining that it, the level of your fire department is any level at which these men performed, the tip of the helmet is in order. And to this day, I just still remember those words because it was the most, uh, it's, it's, when somebody pats you on the back, that's one thing, but when you see it in writing and it, it, it hits home, uh, it, it really uh, was over and above. And we ended up getting an invitation to come back to their Christmas party. Uh, which, uh, surprisingly, was sponsored by a New York City crime family. And since this is being recorded, I'm going to stay uh, lip, short-lipped on that. But it was very, it was an impressive Christmas party. I'll say, I'll, I'll say that. But after we uh, we got back and we did our thing, man, I, I kind of like moved on into fire service. Uh, doing what I love to do and uh, just fighting fire every chance I got. And then uh, in 2005, our, our uh, chief said, look, I want you guys to sign up for this World Trade Center medical monitoring program, yearly physicals, no problem. They're gonna give it to you for free, just go. You got it, yes, sir. Where, how can you say no to that? So I've been getting tested for since 2005. And then in 2005, I would find out that uh, 
with all this stuff going on that I would uh, be diagnosed with cancer in 2018. <clears throat> Fortunately, uh, it was a World Trade Center cancer. What that means when I say fortunately was that it was going to be covered and they were going to cover all my medical for the rest of my life. And hopefully it's a long time because uh, when guys like John Stewart stepped up to the plate uh, that day in front of Congress and made a point to say, hey, we got to do what we got to do to take care of these guys. Uh, it was something uh, it was something that that helped me immensely because at the time that the service that we were getting was very, very poor. And I got to make sure this phone doesn't go dead on me here. Okay. So as, uh, as we continued on uh, this journey of, of a stage four head and neck cancer, uh, they had to quickly operate on me. And it, I, the hardest thing that I had to do was to walk into the fire station and say, guys, uh, I just got diagnosed with cancer. And we had just lost a guy that I got hired with to cancer two years before. So, and again, we're a small department. Everybody knows everybody. And it was, it was such a gut-wrenching thing that uh, when I had to go in and tell them uh, with tears in my eyes, look, I, I'm, it's stage four. And you guys know what stage four is. So it was like, now what? Well, we fight, we roll up our sleeves and we get busy. And uh, sure enough, man, with, with all of this going on, I realized uh, that I would need, um, I think I'm at eight surgeries now. Uh, they did what's called a radical neck surgery. They cut me from here to here, took out 39 lymph nodes all through this, permanently damaged my shoulder. This is as high as I can lift my arm. <clears throat> so when we were doing that mindfulness, if you saw, I was like, trying my best but this was as much as I could get this arm up and as you can see I got a great spirit on this so I, uh, I've learned to accept this cancer and the side effects of it and when I got uh, diagnosed one of the our union reached out to me and said look call this number it's the firefighter cancer support network I'm like okay reach out to them and a, a guy from the FDNY of all places calls me and uh, says, hey, look, I, I have cancer too. And we have, we do this thing called badge to badge support where I'm going to tell you things that no one can else, no one can tell you except a firefighter. So sit down, buckle up and get ready to learn. And he told me the first thing you have to get organized if you're not an organized guy, you need to get organized because soon before you go through all these treatments, especially the chemo and the radiation, you're not going to want to do any of this once you're in the, in these treatments. And he was right. Uh, he said, you have to get, you have to put all your will paperwork together. You have to write your wife a letter. You have to do the cra crazy things that no one would ever tell you. Uh, but but a guy that's fighting cancer right with you that's a fireman. And when, when he told me that, and he said, uh, you know, firefighters, the leading cause of firefighter fatalities now is cancer. And I'm like, what? And I thought for sure it was either building collapses or auto accidents, but cancer, no way. And that was the truth. So what is, uh, is he told me to get my will ready and get my insurance paperwork ready and make sure my wife has numbers available that she could just open a page, go to this and say, look, look, honey, focus on the important stuff. Here's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to have 10 death certificates. You're going to need just the stupid stuff that no one needs to think about at this point. But now that you have cancer and it's a stage four cancer, you better think about this because your, uh, your time is not promised. So here we go with this fight. And they were right about the radiation, man, because the first uh, 20, 20 hits of radiation in that chamber, my head was buckled back into this device and uh, you couldn't move. And I'll never forget tearing up inside that chamber, feeling sorry for myself. And I had visitors from uh, Vince who lost his life to cancer in my, on my job. You know, the guy I spoke about earlier 
and my mom and all these people that died of cancer are coming to me in this chamber of freaking radiation. And, uh, and I have pockets of tears in my eyes and I couldn't move my head. So I had like these lakes of tears in my eyes as I'm laying back and I couldn't shake my head because you're not, you're, you just, you, it's impossible to move your head when, when they clamp your head down to this thing. And uh, I, I, I'm laughing about it now, but it was like at that point uh, when I got to uh, about the 20th hit of radiation and I, I'm thinking, man, I don't know what the big deal is. Uh, it's either I'm a badass or it, there's not a lot to this radiation. And then, and then it hit me. And then uh, my wife was like, oh my God, you just had a big clump of hair fall out of your head. And I'm like, if that's that's the least of my problems right now i i, I am like so nauseous and so sick and i, I have no energy i just want to go home and lay down and uh die basically and 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 that wasn't in my cards man i wasn't going there so i had uh fought through it got my uh 26 treatments under my belt and uh, had signed up for this, one of the most heroic things I've ever done in 28 years was sign up for an experimental trial therapy at Hillman Cancer Center. Uh, they said, uh, the doctors had said, look, you're, you're a candidate for this and they're gonna do a, use a robot on your neck to do this and they're gonna, you know, but you have to sign up for this experimental treatment. And I'm like, uh, fill me in, man. He says, look, we've been treating this cancer for the same way for the last 20 years there's a new there's something new out there and you may want to look at it if it was me i would do it and i'm like okay if he he's that confident in this trial and he thinks i'm a candidate what i got to lose man sign put my name out there and sign away and here i am so i get signed up for this experimental treatment however the World Trade Center would not cover experimental treatments. So that was a whole nother nightmare of the insurance mess that I had to jump through and, and finally got through it. And uh, that was brought more tears. But as I got through this, I, I, I planned a bucket list trip and jumped out of an airplane and rode horseback in the Grand Zion Canyon and or, uh, Bryce Canyon and Grand Canyon and hit Zion out in Utah. And, did, did an amazing trip and come home and what no one ever talks about is the problems that people have that in, are in our line of work until now until recently we've finally like cracked this nut and uh i had experienced uh a tramadol uh, narcotic that I was using for pain and they a, a lady who had never met me never met me she just called me out of the blue and said look I'm the pain management specialist we're taking you off the tramadol uh, patients with in your cancer have uh, seizure problems and we're, we want to get everybody off the tramadol so we're ch moving you back to oxy and we're going to give you the 10 milligram dosage uh, and where do you want that sent? And I'm like, okay, we'll send it to my, my drugstore and, you know, I'm going to pick it up. So every time, I, I, for, so for the next probably two weeks, I was on the Oxy. And now you got to understand, I've been on so many narcotics for all, all these surgeries and left shoulders and spinal accessory nerves. It, it's, it's been a nightmare. And quickly, I never thought in a million years, I would ever be someone that would become dependent. And I did. And I tried myself to self-detox. And I, I told my wife the one time, and I said, look, I'm tired of these pills. The kids call them zombie pills. Uh, I'm no longer living like that. I'm stopping everything right here, right now. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take a run at this because like I said, I had just gotten off a bucket list trip. I did not want to live my life doped up like I, I had been. And when I got off of them five days, I made it five days and I had a terrible PTSD moment. And this moment brought me right back to the heart of crawling under that beam. And in one hour, 
I not only would plan my suicide, but I would follow through it. It was going to be very simple. I did not want to hang myself or shoot myself or do something that would just destroy my family. I had a plan that I would go unconscious on this medication and slide into my pool and drowned. And it would be like, oh, wow, the fireman drowned in his own pool. And that was my plan. And that's the plan that I put to work and all within an hour. And I had walked to the steps of my pool and I knew that the, the, the medication was kicking in. And I knew that very shortly I'd be going unconscious. And one of the things that I did not take into consideration, thank you, Lord, praise God every day for it, uh, was cold water immersion. And cold water immersion worked exactly opposite of what I had expected. And when I had uh, started down the steps into the pool and I knew that I was going unconscious, I, I, could, I could tell. And once I got under there, I was like, and then it, a remarkable thing happened where it took the, the effects of what I had just taken and reversed them. And it, it brought me to a super heightened alert status of uh, paranoia and looking around at, at the pool and the surroundings and thinking, oh my God, I just survived this. I said, I, I'm, and I was dead set on leaving this world. You, it was, I was gonna be a figment of people's imaginations uh, a week later and no one would have ever known that I had done this. And, and finally being able now to tell this story because when I got a hold of my World Trade Center team, uh, they call it the red team, and they're quickly, uh, when I explained to them what I had just done, they said, we want to get you to a place called the Center of Excellence. It's in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and it's a treatment center for firefighters with mental PTSD, uh, chemical, and alcohol. And how soon can you get there? And I said, I could be there tonight. And that's how it went, man. I, I uh, driven my, drove myself to the center of accidents and no one knew. My fire department didn't know. No one knew this even happened. There was no ambulance. There was no report. There was nothing. It was just something that, I survived a suicide attempt and I am now mixed in with all these fire broken firefighters from across the country that are equally as damaged as I was. And I had formed bonds with, with those people that are uh, second to none. And I know that people always say all oh, the brotherhood and the fire service is great. And you know, kind of like the same with the police, they, blue line, the red line, and you know, the EMS cr crews, everybody's kind of like looks after everybody. But uh, this group was something special because we all had something, whether it was narcotic abuse or uh, alcohol. And me, I come in with, uh, I survived a suicide attempt. And um, I'm like, how do I even begin to understand this? And Sure enough, as I'm doing this, <laughs> I'm like AWOL from the Firefighter Cancer Support Network because they just put me into the state director position. And how I got there was when Tony Cruz, the FDNY guy that called me and he called me again a year later and said, hey, I, I'm, I'm looking for a, a guy in Pennsylvania. Uh, I think you could be that guy. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm sitting here on my butt, not doing anything, man. I could pick up the phone and talk to, just like you talked to me. And I got no problem telling people, hey, this is what you're gonna be going through because I've been there. And he said, that's how we're made up, man. Everybody, 90% of the firefighter cancer support network are firefighters that have survived cancer. And he said, now your goal is to survive this and hopefully you will. But in the meantime, when somebody gets diagnosed in Pennsylvania, I hope that uh, I can count on you to talk to them. I said, absolutely. So he, so he made me a state director, which uh, blew me away because I had no idea of what was about to come. Uh, 
I thought I would just be picking up the phone and talking to people, but there's a lot more to it than that. And thank God it is, man, because it, it keeps my mind uh, from just sitting around watching TV and getting mad at the news channels for everything that's going on in the world. But uh, as we quickly got out of, not quickly, 32 days I spent at the Center of Excellence. And uh, after I got out, we started with this campaign of uh, worldwide peer support. Uh, one of the guys said, look, we're going to start these Zoom calls and we're going to get on these uh, Zoom meetings and we're going to give everybody a chance to come on and just tell us how you're doing today. And we'll have different topics of what we can talk about and how everybody's dealing with it. And it was kind of like a way, once you left there, to continue to receive treatment. And kind of like what I'm doing here right now with you guys and what you guys do, uh, you know, the mindfulness and, you know, peer support is just amazing. It, it's, uh, it's a way to give back now. Like I said, I've been given a gift. I've been given a gift of survival. And there's not many I know. And I've actually just finally put this in writing to my fire chief uh, this past month of how. I almost lost my life and, and just, uh, I'm, I'm ashamed, man. I'm really, I'm still ashamed of, of what, where I was, what I did. And uh, I can't get past that part of it, especially when I'm, I go out to the pool. Like lately our pool has been uh, super nice. And when I'm in that pool, I'm thinking, wow, uh, how did I get blessed with this chance of, of survival. I just, to this day, I don't understand it, but I'm here for a reason. And uh, I was graciously invited to come on and tell my story. And I, I thank you guys all for listening. Uh, I, I open it up to questions like I always do. Uh, and when for the last 10 years, I've uh, taught 9-11 history at our local McKeesport High School. Uh, they get the, the kids together and I show, I have a presentation of uh, the trip to New York and the people we worked with and I open it up to questions so at this time man if anybody has any questions uh, feel free Jimmy wow that was an amazing story thank you so much for sharing it with us um, I'm curious about what some of the other responsibilities are with the fire cancer support network. You said it's not, it's more than you, than you were expecting. What all does that, um, entail? Well, I, I've never well, been, I've one never been one for, uh, really, for, doing, uh, uh, really uh, doing paperwork. It's one of the reasons I, I never one really, reasons reasons I, I never went on the fire department, uh, or a deputy because the paperwork, but, uh, when we get a, what's called a request for assistance, and that's where my band is on, my armband, Firefighter Cancer Support Network. When uh, I get a request for assistance, like it's a national uh, phone number. So anybody could go on the Firefighter Cancer Support Network website, reach out and fill out uh, need assistance. And that assistance will go to the state director of the state that you are a firefighter in <clears throat> and in that uh, position I have my main role is to talk to the diagnosed firefighter and offer them uh, what I was offered and now because of where I'm at in in my job I've been given, a, I've learned so much on the firefighter cancer presumption law in my state. I had to become an expert on that. And when people call you for legal advice, naturally, we, we don't, we at the Cancer Support Network, we just don't say, hey, call this attorney, call that attorney. It's not about that. It's about uh, informing them on informing the diagnosed firefighter, whether it's female or male, uh, what's about to happen and the role that you need to take now by getting organized because you're going to have to deal with workers' compensation. You're going to have to deal with the uh, 
In Pennsylvania, we have what's called heart and lung that covers police, fire, and correctional officers. It's a special uh, insurance package that we have. It's kind of like workers' comp, but it covers the extra one third. So I've, for the last three years, I've been blessed with receiving my salary. And when you're on this heart and lung, it's uh, tax free. So when you get a firefighter that's not sure how to navigate all this, I'm like, look, this is, you're talking to the right guy because I've, uh, I've been dealing with this for three and a half years now. I'm going on four years and I'm trying to get to the five year remission mark. And if, if and when that I get there and I, I'm really positive, I think positively that I'll get there. Uh, but when it's stage four, it's metastatic. So it means it's outside the lymph system and it could go anywhere. And, and right now my, my liver uh, tests are off right now. So they're doing some, I just got blood work today. So they're working on, I'm staying focused on, on surviving this. So as I get these diagnosed firefighters, their phone calls and I reach out to them. And now it's, uh, it's more of a mission of getting them a toolbox and that toolbox is what we provide each one and it's basically a mini filing cabinet with file folders and uh, a business card book uh, pens paperwork on cancer research cancer uh, peer support and basically you know the fire service in the firefighter cancer support network we're always available 24 7 so kind of like peer support where you guys are, anybody that ever has a problem can pick up the phone and call you guys 24 seven and somebody will be able to at least make contact with that person. And, and then there's the part of organizing uh, the role of the fire instructors, which uh, I really enjoy going and teaching uh, to the fire classes, the candidates classes that are coming up through the ranks, because I always thought that uh, how cool it was to have that leather helmet all dirty and sooty and my gear was always the dirtiest because I've been to the most fires and I, and I really, really was good at what I did. I mean, I'm not, not, it's not a bragging thing. It's not a hero thing or nothing like that. I really was a good firefighter. I really took it seriously and I tried to uh, be the best teacher that I could be when I was there for the younger guys coming on the ranks through the ranks and and like any job you, you go to and you you you, you get kind of complacent over the years and uh, you know I became that old fireman that I, I never thought I'd ever be but I was blessed to be it and then you know once I got diagnosed that all changed and and that's how the what the, the role with the firefighter cancer support network has helped me uh, get me off the recliner and onto the computer and doing more research and and trying to uh, be that when they ask me the questions I try to be the guy that answers them <coughs> well Jimmy I also want to express uh, uh, just my incredible honor to sit here and listen to your story and uh, I just really appreciate the courage you've taken to share and open up with us I also want to read a uh, note that uh, Susan Hiltz, who is a 20-year corrections officer up in Ontario, she has written to you, thank you for opening up your life struggles and triumphs with us. You have inspired me and also touched my heart. You have been truly blessed. Keep fighting the good fight. So That's you've got awesome. brothers and sisters all across a uh, couple of countries here in your corner. Thank you. That's uh, that that it touches my soul when I hear hear that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, thank you. Amazing. Uh, I think my jaw is on the floor. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, you've 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 taken us through many many years of of your life and your struggles, and I'm just so happy to see you here. And I enjoyed our conversation before we got going, and you show me around your garage and just to get a sense of, of here you are day after day working through your struggles and just really appreciate you. Thank you. And I, I do got to add this because this was uh, something 
when I met Katie, uh, the very next day I would go to the uh, FDIC convention and it was the first time I'd ever been there and naturally the Firefighter Cancer Support Network had a booth there and we were talking to people left and right and uh, they had a 9-11 memorial, memorial stair climb and I had just thought about how the blisters that I had on my feet from being on my feet all this time and I thought you know what what do I got to lose? I already got this loop recorder in my chest to monitor my heart. And uh, uh, that's another cancer related story. Uh, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to give this a shot. I, I was watching the introduction and I heard the bagpipes and I'm a bagpiper. So I had uh, automatically said, you know what, I'm going to do this 9-11 climb. And even if I do 32 of the 3,200 steps or something like that, some crazy amount of steps that the, the, the towers held, I, I said, and now once I started it, I just, you know, I got tied in with this guy from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was carrying the American flag and I was not in gear. I was just in uh, my work boots and uh, just <laughs> I climbed steps like a champ, man. And when I get up to the top, I'd be like sitting out, <sighs> you know, and no training, zero training. And uh, and I, I'm putting this on on my Facebook page too because uh, it, it and and some of the FDNY guys that I'm still tight with, they're like, Jimmy, you have nothing to prove, man. Stop it before you hurt yourself. And I, and, I'm, and I, at the time I was just posting the videos. I wasn't like commenting on anything, but when I got done, uh, there was a nurse in our uh, worldwide peer support group and you know, she saw me wig, wobbly legged and uh, she said, you sit here and you're not moving for the next 15 minutes while well, I keep my eye on you. And sure enough, man, I, I, I got to ring the bell at the end of that, uh, that stair climb. Now I'm be honest with you. I did not do every stair. I, I, cut some of the corners but i'm probably in all honesty probably did 60 percent of it so I, and for zero training uh i was very proud of myself and that was uh pretty cool pretty badass that's quite a spirit you got spirit drove you up there well folks i want to uh you know honor everybody's schedule and time um jimmy you shared just a whole lot of your evening tonight Appreciate that so much. And uh, please know this is going to be up and available. If you want to uh, send any friends, colleagues, anybody in your peer support to hear your story, this is going to be available for, for folks to, to watch and listen to and, and I think be moved by for a long time. So are, are there are there any other questions? I know we're we you know we're past our our nine o'clock, and Jimmy, I don't want to take up the rest of your night. Um, how are you feeling about your time? I'm good, man. I'm out far away. I have I don't even have the clock on. I'm not even paying attention. Well, I'll just I'll just give this a, a, an opening if uh, somebody wants to unmute and. There's some other comments there if you want to read them. Oh, thank you, Sue. I see that now. So Gary Meltzer, who is a, a, a gentleman up also in Ontario who works with our mindfulness-based wellness and resiliency training and a, also a volunteer who provides support for uh, incarcerated folks in, in prisons up there. Gary says, Jimmy, heart-wrenching and inspiring at the same time. We talk about and try our best to offer skills that engender resilience you are the embodiment of it and deserve all the gratitude and recognition for your work and support to your fellow firefighters in all their struggles. Thank you very much. That's from Gary and then from Robert Allemiller, your courageous brother, thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. Mm -hmm.